How about uh, Sly Stallone, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky? Rocky's story is this even, right? But Sly's is too. Sly's a good friend of mine. And when I first met him years ago, he's listening to my tapes and stuff, and he invited me over for dinner, and we started talking. And I said, you know, I've heard your story from other people, but I'd really love to hear it from the horse's mouth. I don't know how much is mythology, you know, urban myth, and how much is true. So he told me his whole story. He said the essence of it, though, was he said he knew his whole life what he wanted to do since he was very, very young. He wanted to be in the movie business, period. I mean, not just TV, movies. And he, just, he said why was, for him, it was a chance to have people not only escape, but to inspire people. And by the way, that drive is what made most of his movies, inspire people to what they're capable of, to overcome unbelievable obstacles, because in his own life he felt like he did that. When he was born, he was pulled out by the forceps. That's why he looked the way he did. That's why he talked the way he did. And he said, so I really want to do that. And he said, I knew why I want to do it, and I wasn't willing to settle for anything else. And he said, what happened was, I went out to try and get jobs, and it's not like I went, hey, Adrian, and they went, you, you're a star. It didn't work out real well. They looked at me and said, hey, you're stupid looking. Do something else. You know, what is this talking like this? There's no place for you in that stuff. You're never going to be a star in the movies. You're insane. No one's going to want to listen to somebody who looks dopey and talks out of the side of their mouth, right? And he got no after no after no after no. He said, I was thrown out more, fit, more than 1,500 times of agents' offices in New York. I said, there aren't 1,500 agents in New York. He said, I know. I've been to them five, six, seven, eight, nine times. He said, I remember one guy went in there, and I got in there at 4 o'clock, and he wouldn't see me, so I stayed there, and I would not leave. And I stayed overnight. They came back the next morning. I was still sitting there. He said, that's how I got my first job. The guy said, fine, come in here. And he sat down, and he went through this, and he gave me my first movie. I said, oh, really? I thought Rocky was first movie. He said, no, this other movie, I've never heard of it. He said, I said, well, what character did you play? He said, well, I was in it for about 20 seconds. I was a thug that somebody beat up. He said, because they made me feel like, you know, somebody, people hate your guts. You getting beat up, it'll be a good thing. And he did like three movies like that. Never got anything. Kept going out. Rejection, rejection, rejection. So finally he realized it wasn't working. So he changed his approach. He said, I was starving, by the way. He said, I couldn't pay for even to have heat in my apartment. My wife was screaming at me every day to go get a job. I said, well, why didn't you? He said, because I knew that if I got a job, he said, I'd get seduced back and I'd lose my hunger. He said, I knew that the only way I could do this is if it was the only choice, if I burned all other bridges. Because if I did a normal job, pretty soon I'd be caught up in that rhythm and that stuff, and I'd feel okay about my life, and i feel like my dream would just gradually disappear. And he said, I wanted to keep that hunger. That hunger was the only thing I thought was my advantage. He said, my wife didn't understand that at all. And he said, we'd have these vicious fights. And he said, it was freezing. So I was broke. We had no money. And he said, so I finally went to the public library one day because it was warm. He said, I didn't want to read anything. So I went in, New York Public Library. He said, I was hanging out there, and I sat down in this chair, and somebody left a book there. And he said, I, I looked down at this book, and it was the poems of Edgar Allan, stories of Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, so I started reading it, and he said, I got totally into Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, I know everything about it. And he goes on for another 20 minutes telling me about Edgar Allan Poe. He knows everything, how he died, what it was about, what really happened. And I said, well, what did Poe do for you? He said, Poe got me out of myself. He got me to think about how I could touch other people and not worry about myself so much. And he said, it made me decide to become a writer. I said, just imagine Rocky the writer, right? And he said, so I tried to write a bunch of screenplays. Nothing worked, nothing worked. I was totally broke. He said, I didn't even have 50 bucks. And he said, and finally, he said, I sold a script. And it was called Paradise Alley. He said, it's a movie I made many years later, but I sold it. And he said, I sold it for 100 bucks. He said, but 100 bucks was a ton of money, man. I was so thrilled. I thought, I'm on my way. But it never led to anything. And he said, so finally, he said, I kept going and going and going. He said, finally, we were so broke. He said, I hawked my wife's jewelry. He said, Tony, there's some things in life you should never do. <laughs> he said, that was basically the end of our relationship. She hated my guts so much. He said, now we were so broke, we had nothing, no food, no money. And he said, the one thing I loved most in the world was my dog. He said, I love my dog because he gave me unconditional love, unlike my wife. And he said, so what happened was, though, we were so broke that to survive, I couldn't even feed my dog. So I went to a liquor store. He said, it was the lowest day of my life. And I stood outside the liquor store trying to sell my dog to strangers. He said, I tried to sell my dog for 50 bucks. And he said, this, finally this one guy negotiated with me and bought my dog for me, my best friend on earth, for $25. He said, I walked away from there and I cried. He said, it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. He said, two weeks later, I'm watching a fight between Muhammad Ali and Weppner, this white guy that's getting bludgeoned but just keeps on coming. And he said, I got an idea. He said, I, as soon as the fight ended, I started writing. He said, I wrote for 20 straight hours. I did not sleep. I wrote the entire movie in 20 hours straight. Right then. Saw the fight, wrote the movie. Whole thing. Done. 
He said, I was shaking at the end. I was so excited. He said, I really knew, man. I knew what I wanted. I knew why I wanted it. He said, just like you teach that formula. He said, but I said, man, I took the action. Now it's time to deliver. And so he said, I went out and started trying to sell it to agents. And they all would read it and they'd say, you know, this is predictable. This is stupid. This is sappy. He said, I wrote down all the things they said. And I read them the night of the Oscars when we won. Right? He said, it was really good, right? The greatest revenge is massive success. <laughs> and he said, so what happened was, he said, I kept going, trying to sell it, trying to sell it. Nobody go. I'm broke. I'm starving. He said, finally, I meet these guys. They read it, and they believe in the script, and they love it. And they offer me $125,000 for my script. I said, oh, my God, you must have been out of your mind. He said, I was. I said, just one thing, though, guys. You've got to deal based on one thing. And they said, what's that? He said, i got to star in it. They went, Pfft. What are you talking about? You're a writer. He said, no, no, I'm an actor. He said, no, 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 you're a writer. He said, no, no, I'm an actor. That is my story, and I'm Rocky. He said, I got to play it. You know, I got to be the head person. I got to be the starring role. And they said, there's no way. We're not going to pay you $125,000, take some no name, and stick you in that and throw our money away. We need a star, you know? And they want to have Ryan O'Neill play Rocky to give you a picture. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's who they picked, right? And so he said, no way, Ryan O'Neill isn't Rocky, I'm Rocky, went through this whole thing, right? They finally, he said, they said, well, take it or leave it. He said, I left the room. I said, if that's what you believe, you don't get my script, and he left. Here's a man with no money, none, totally broke, offered $125,000 more money than seen in his lifetime, and he walked away because he knew his real what? Knew his real what? And why he wanted, he was committed to it. So he said, they called him a few weeks later, and they came and brought him back, and they offered him a quarter of a million dollars not to star in his own movie. He turned it down, $250,000. They came back, their final offer was $325,000. They wanted this thing. He said, not without me, and they said no. They finally compromised, and they gave him $35,000 and points in the movie, because they said, if this is going to happen, then you're going to take the risk with us. And the bottom line is, we don't think it'll work, but at least we won't spend a bunch of money on you. And they only spent a million dollars to make Rocky, and it grossed $200 million at the time. I, I mean, it was done pretty well. But what's interesting about this is, here's, I said, what'd you do? I mean, even 35000 it's not a quarter of a million. That's a lot of money when you don't have 25 bucks. I said, what's the first thing you did? I figured you went out and partied or something. He said, I went to that liquor store for three straight days and hoped that the man who had my dog frequented the store. He said, because I want to buy back my dog. I thought that was so cool, right? That was really cool. I said, what happened? He said, third day I was there, this guy walks by, and I see him, and I can't believe it, and there's my dog. And I looked at him, and I said, sir, remember me? And he said, it had been about a month and a half by the time this had all come about. And he said, remember me? You know, I'm the guy that sold you the dog. And I goes, yeah, yeah, I love the dog. He said, well, look. He said, I was so broke, I was starving. He's my best friend. I'm sure you love him, too, but i got to have him black. Please, I beg of you. He said, I'll pay you $100 for the dog. I know you paid me $25, but I'll give you $100. And the man said, absolutely not. No way. He's my dog now. You can't buy him back. Right? And Sly said, you know, Tony, you know how you say, know your outcome? I said, yeah. He said, I knew it. And he said, I kept changing my approach, so I went, $500 for the dog. The guy said, absolutely no way. He said, $1,000 for my dog. The guy said, no amount of money on earth is ever going to get this dog from you. I said, what'd you do? He said, I knew my outcome, right? Because he listened to these tapes, kept doing them. He said, I decided to take massive action. He said, I got my dog. I just kept changing my approach, so I got it. I said, what'd it cost you? $15,000 and a part in Rocky. The guy's in Rocky. You know that dog in Rocky, Butt Kiss? That's Sly's real dog, right? That's the dog. He bought him back. So, so he put his dog in the movie and he put the guy in the movie and paid 15 grand while he had 35,000. Isn't that pretty cool? Pretty awesome. So there's always a way if you're committed. <laughs> Just got to keep changing your approach.